Hello everyone. Good morning to US, Canada and good evening for India. Today we are going to do the guidepost 10. Uh, this will be the last session for the Gift of Imperfections book review. It is Cultivate Laughter, Song and Dance. Let go of being cool and always in control. <clears throat> this is a very interesting topic. So there are some quotes by Mark Twain. Um, one, he said that dance like no one is watching, sing like no one is listening, love like you have never been hurt and live like it's heaven on earth. I love this. It's, it's very hard for us. Like we get embarrassed when we have to sing before other people or dance. Dance is a very big one. <clears throat> and some people who have been in love, if they got hurt, they are, they go into a shell. They are like, it all, it will always lead to hurt. What if they die? What if they leave us? Things like that, right? But I think the whole point is about taking a risk and be doing things that will really make you happy, right? And we are innately social beings. We, as a human race, we are innately social beings. We are impelled almost instinctively to share our joy. Anytime you you get a promotion or you have a child or you have, you're getting married or your siblings are getting married, your parents get something, you buy a car, you buy a house, our intention is to share. Right away, we are like bubbling with joy to see who I can share with, right? And we do all these uh, parties and housewarming functions and naming ceremonies. Everything is to share our joy with the world. So we are like that. So it is to, everything is, it's, it's not a lone thing. We have to share it with people. And whenever we meet people, we share things, there is always laughter, song and dance involved, right? So why are laughter, song and dance so important to us? Is there some transformational element that they have in common? So we are going to look at those, answering those questions today. So <clears throat> um, we yearn to laugh and sing and dance when we feel joy, as I mentioned, but we also turn to the swamps, not just when we are happy, but we are lonely, we are sad, we are excited, we are in love, we are heartbroken, we are afraid, we are ashamed, like the list goes on, right? Basically every single emotion uh, especially if you see Indian music, right? I think there is a movie song in whichever language you want for every single emotion there is. And when you're driving in your car or when you're listening at home, everything based on your mood, I'm pretty sure you can find a song to listen to and connect to. And what happens when I listen to those songs? <clears throat> Somebody, why are, how are movies made, right? A common topic is taken and basically it connects to a lot of people, not just one. The moment you hear a song, you will realize that, okay, I'm not alone. At least there is one more person, the author of the song, the composer of the song, the lyric writer who felt like this or who he thought that somebody that he or she knows felt like this. So I'm not alone, right? And all the people who are listening to those, they connect to it. That's why they are listening to those, right? So that makes you feel like it's okay. My pain is not like isolated and I'm not the only one kind of stuff, right? Laughter, song and dance create emotional and spiritual connection. They remind us of the one thing that truly matters when we are searching for comfort, celebration, inspiration or healing. We are not alone, right? She's Bene, Dr. Brainy Brown, the author of this book. <clears throat> so there is, a, I, I'm pretty sure, as I said, there is a song for every occasion, I think. Um, I wanted to write a blog. For me personally, I um, used to listen to Bhule Bhisre Geet when I was growing up when I was very little. It was all the old songs um, from uh, Hindi, Bollywood uh, music, right? And I used to, I never watched them on TV. So I used to create my own visual for it. Honestly, I got very disappointed later on after I saw some of the videos says that, oh, you know what, I would have directed it better kind of thing. But I, I did not have a tape recorder for a very long time. And even when I had it, uh, I used to have like one or two uh, tapes to listen to music. So it was mostly I used to rely on radio for all the music. <clears throat> and when I listened to music, I was like, you know, the mix, how they put like one sad song or when, when it's a um, patriotic day, like um, Independence Day or Children's Day or something like that, based on the theme, Rakhi, Holi, Diwali, based on that, they play all the songs themed playlist, right? I really used to love that and I used to cherish. And I later on, for me, every song that I really loved and used to sing a lot 
had a story behind it. Like who introduced that song to me, right? And when I used to blog in 2007, <clears throat> I started back in 2007 and I had a blog, I started, I never published it. That uh, story behind the song. How do I know this eight song? Which friend has introduced this to me? And uh, what is my connection with that song kind of thing? I think I'll do it sometime. <clears throat> Knowing laughter. So we are going to talk about laugh, song and dance individually. So we'll start with laughter. What is knowing laughter? La knowing laughter is um, basically Dr. Brené Brown. She learned most about laughter during her eight years of study. She's a researcher, shame researcher. She went to a lot of people, people in jails, people in homes, people in hospitals and everything. And she understood and regular people, everybody who did not have any of fall, did not fall into these categories. And she researched shame. That's how she came up with this book. And surprisingly, she learned the most about laughter when she was studying shame. <clears throat> so basically, shame resilience requires laughter. We talked about shame resilience, right? <clears throat> so knowing laughter is the kind of laughter that helps us heal. That if, if you say that, let's say one of your parents passed away, you are sharing your story and there is a smile or there is a way I can talk to you. And let's say you try to put it behind with a kind of laughter that has pain induced in it. I understand it because it's empathy, right? I had my uh, one of my parents pass away. So I understand it's like looking at you and smiling that way or laughing that way or sharing your sadness through laughter. That is like saying that I understand what you're going through, right? That is knowing laughter. She says that laughter is a spiritual form of communing. <clears throat> Without words, we can say to one another, I am with you, I get it. That is called as knowing laughter. Um, Amy Lamott, she said laughter is a bubbly, effervescent form of holiness. Uh, she read a lot of Amy Lamott books, uh, Dr. Brené Brown, and she quotes her often in, the, uh, in her book. So I thought I'll put her picture here. Um, it's basically, I think that laughter in any form it has some kind of uh, freedom to it, you know? And wherever there is freedom, that is what I think a human race, you should feel free. You have to all, we are intended to be free that way, right? The entanglements that we put towards ourselves is all society-based, culture-based, tradition-based, and everything is in our head. Most of the things, maybe it is not, but we assume that, we chain ourselves with all these things based on our assumptions also, our imagination, our, you know, all those things. But you cannot laugh in that situation. You cannot be free. When you're laughing, you are free. You are uh, free of worry, at least in that moment. It doesn't mean that people who laugh do not have any problems. It's not that. It's just that the more free you are, the more relieved you will be. And the more laughter you have in your life, it actually takes the edge off of a lot of things. <clears throat> what is true laughter? So there is laughter. Um, it is not the use of humor as self-deprecation, deflection, painful laughter. There are a lot of people who make fun of themselves, who say that, yeah, I'm horrible. I do this, I do that. And they make it into a joke, right? It is not like that. It is not about deflecting from your pain. It is not a very painful laughter kind of thing. That is not true laughter. True laughter is it embodies the relief and connection we experience when we realize the power of sharing our stories, irrespective of what our story is or how it ends or what it involves, right? We are not laughing at, but with each other. We are like, you know, there's a difference. You're not making fun of people. You're not ridiculing others. So song, coming to song, <clears throat> as I said, I think there is a song for every mood that people have and every phase of your life you're in and every um, category of things, right? It's like music reaches out and offers us connection. If you are somebody who is very devotional, who is religious, who goes to temples and all our temples play all these songs, right? Devotional songs all the time. You can connect with them. I, you might be a stranger to me, Recently, Dasra, the Indian festival Dasra happened. We all go to some Golu or something. 
I know only the host, not many other people there, but we all get connected by singing Aigiri Nandini or something, one of the Devi songs, right? So, and let's say you go to a party and they're playing a song in the background and it's a very popular movie song. Everybody can dance to it and at least clap to it if you're not comfortable dancing. And we connect and then we at least start the small talk, like, did you watch this movie, right? So it kinds of creates that connection, right? Again, all these songs, national anthem, college fight song, song on the radio, soundtrack of a movie, all these things. If you see somewhere, we cannot really live without it. We cannot live without song, right? <clears throat> and not everyone shares the same passion for music. Some people, they don't listen to music. Actually, there are people who don't listen. You think so. But if you actually know them, start. they listen to podcasts, they listen to this, they are really serious about things. But if you actually know them closer, they will like one of the categories of this. They do like it, right? But because song has ability to move us emotionally, we watch movies. We uh, Actually, this is one of the exercises you can do to understand the meaning of like how much music plays a role in things, right? Watch a very dramatic movie, a thriller movie or a suspense thriller or anything, or a very emotional movie or a very romantic scene. Watch it with background, like, you know, with sound on and sound off. If you watch actually making of the movies, it is so boring. It is so boring because they actually do the scene with they speaking, the voice be, has not been dubbed yet, like, to full volume, right? So you, they, you hear them talking like very softly. The lip moment is there, but the background music is not there. And it is so boring. But the same thing you watch in the full movie version of it, it's amazing, right? It completely changes the scene to you. There are places where you sit, you don't even, you're in a very happy mood. You got a promotion today. You're very happy. You're celebrating. You're watching a movie. When there is a very sad scene, you would tend to cry. You completely become that character. You completely shape that character becomes your friend, your sibling, your father, your mother, whatever, right? That is the power of song. That is the power of music. It can emotionally move you. So it is very important. Anything that has such tremendous power is very important in your life. And dancing. <clears throat> I think dancing is a very, very tough issue for a lot of people. Um, why? Because we want to be cool. We want to be in control. We don't want people to think of us as stupid or awkward or goofy, right? If you laugh, anything, right? Laugh. If, you, if you're laughing hysterically, your parents or your spouse, come on, what is going on? Jeez, calm it down. Tone it down. What is going on? Can you compose yourself, you know? And singing, if you're singing off note, it's like, oh my God, can you stop? There might be somebody who knows music here and they can be devastated when you listen to you sing. My younger one, the other day, he has a very good um, pitch. I was singing some Hindi song and um, he was listening to me. And if you know music, you know naturally the progression of notes, right? The arohana and avarohana of things. He was listening to me and said, why did you sing in B flat at that note? Oh my God, can you stop please? That That's his remark to me. I'm like, oh my God, what is wrong with you? I don't know what B flat sounds like. <laughs> right? So... But does it mean that I should stop singing? No, it makes me happy. I am not a trained musician, but I do sing songs. It's, it's like, you know, but the thing is, dancing is at another level. You can make fun of yourself when you laugh like crazy, when you, at times, when you uh, sing off note or something like that, but dancing is, oh my God, you, it's, it takes a lot of courage to actually go and uh, dance in front of people. There is no form of self-expression that makes us feel more vulnerable than dancing. It's like, you know, it's like a full body vulnerability kind of thing. You cannot, uh, I think it's very, very hard to let go and dance. A lot of people say, I have no rhythm. Uh, actually, I want to buy this shirt. I have no rhythm. I cannot sing and I cannot dance. But I do all the three. <laughs> uh, dance at home. Sometimes what we do is sometimes when we like, when a very upbeat song is going on, we tap our legs or we clap or something like that. That means you do have rhythm, you connect to the rhythm, right? Um, it's very difficult for us to put us all, all out there, right? Some people, they dance in the confines of their house, in their bedroom, in their bathroom, but they don't in front of everybody, right? 
And yes, some people are more inclined to music, more inclined to rhythm, more inclined to song. It comes naturally to them. They're gracefully really good when they are dancing. But that does not mean you should not do it. And this came to me very, very late. Actually, in 2019, um, I, I never, I attended some of my, like a couple of my cousin's weddings and receptions and all that. They played DJ music at the end and everybody dances. My son, younger son was three years old back like so several years ago and he was dancing like crazy. He was the youngest guy who, he listened to Punjabi songs for the first time, the pump adrenaline, right? He danced like crazy with his other cousin. My mom, all the old people, young people, everybody were having so much fun. They were dancing. I was the only one who was sitting on the tables, not going and joining them. My mom was like, come on. You're... And she was like, what will people think? What is wrong with you? Why are you so stuck up? Just come and dance. The other side, right? What will people think if you don't dance? Just come and dance. I did not go. My younger one came and said, come on, Amma, come on, come on, dance. So I went and the max I did was move my steps from one to another. And then I clapped to the beat of the song. That's the max dance I could do. In 2019, I went to um, attended Sadhguru's program. And you know, the, the last uh, dance, right? The Alai Alai song. I don't know. That's a very popular song. It's so beautiful. It's amazing. And everybody breaks into dance. Everybody dances. And then at that day, I decided, oh my God, why is it so difficult for me to move? Why am I like so like a stick? Why can't I move? So I decided that day that I will learn, like I will at least be comfortable in dancing. Not that I will be a good dancer, but I should be comfortable in dancing. Uh, actually, that's when later on I started reading this book. And recently, I went to... Um, uh, Garba, Navratri Garba dancing program. I signed up for it with my neighbors. We all went and we danced. My neighbor is a Kathak dancer. She actually, she was so graceful. Oh my God. And she would listen and say, okay, I will teach you right now. We had a mini learning lesson in our house. One of our other friends came and taught us and she was like, oh my God, what will I do with these girls kind of thing. <laughs> but once we went there, the, our other neighbor, she was like runtime teaching us steps and we danced and it was so much fun. For the first time, I didn't care. I did not wear the proper Navratri outfit. I wore an Anarkali dress because I didn't have that. But I didn't care. I danced. I did not look at anybody else. I was only looking at my neighbor who dances very well and is trying to teach her steps. And I was trying to look her and follow and do steps. And I had so much fun. So I think, so how did I come from not moving a muscle at all to being okay with it? Did anything change about me? I don't think so. Did I become a great dancer? I don't think so. But it is just the letting go of what's the worst that will happen. Everybody's there to enjoy themselves. Nobody's there to judge you, you know? <clears throat> so it's like that. If you let go of what people will think, then I think you can enjoy yourself a little bit. Dance is in our DNA. It's not super hip and cool dancing like professional dancers, but a strong pull towards rhythm and movement. Anybody, young, old, anybody, if you see, they respond to music. They respond to rhythm. For babies, even when they're in the womb of the mom, they put music for them, right? If they're in children, actually children, they don't care. You put music, they will dance. They will dance, not maybe gracefully to the beat, but they don't have that inhibitions. They always dance with joy and pleasure until... As they are growing up, you have to come on, stop dancing like that. You look so silly. We grown-ups instill those ideas in them of to think about others, right? <clears throat> they say that what one loves in childhood stays in your heart forever. So if you danced when you were young, that means you can dance, right? But these are all like singing, dancing, laughing like crazy. These are all exercises in vulnerability. These are like putting yourself out there, the natural, authentic you. It's not like, what will people think? Will this, is this good enough? Should I do it or not? What will my reputation be? All those things, right? If you shed all those layers and you're okay, this is my true self. You might have seen me as a professional doing this very well, but in this area, I'm not so good, but it's okay. We want for people to see the perfect us. If we are not perfect in an area, don't show that area to them at all. Why even bring it up? Don't even, this is the saying in interviews, right? 
what are your strengths and weaknesses they always say create weaknesses in a way that they also show as you consider them as a weakness but for the company it's actually a strength like something like oh i overwork if there is a deadline i forget my work life balance i tend to sit long hours and finish it you are treating that <clears throat> it's a smart weakness right you are saying that is a weakness but it's actually you are telling the company that oh that's nice if they have deadlines they will sit and work right that's a benefit for the company so you are trying to always portray the positive side of you but why nobody is perfect it's okay you are good at certain things you are not good at lot of things it is okay it is okay to be that way so dance stays in our heart even when our head becomes overly concerned with what people might think it's good for our soul right a good belly laugh singing at the top of our lungs dancing like no one is looking that's really good for your soul so what are the shame triggers <clears throat> that stop us from doing these things it's fear of being perceived as awkward silly uncool out of control immature right there are a lot of shame triggers shame triggers around the vulnerability of laughing song and dance it's a very scary list for a lot of us we are like shy and we don't want to do stuff because of this self expression take a back seat to self protection and self consciousness and often times the questions are what will people think everyone is watching calm down you look ridiculous get a hold of yourself your people either you will think that or somebody in your family will make sure to remind you of that so why do we want to do this why do we not want to express ourselves because we always want to look cool and in control right we by being perceived as cool we we'll, like how do we achieve that we minimize the vulnerability and we reduce the risk of being ridiculed made fun of right we hustle for our worthiness by slipping on the emotional and behavioral straight jacket of cool posturing as tragically hip and terminally better than for some reason we have this need to show that i'm better than you if you are my neighbor i'm better than you in this if my if you are my colleague i'm better than you in this it's like this either i am really better than you because i have a quality that is better than you or i'm better than you in not making myself stupid enough or foolish enough or i'm better than you in controlling not to show what i'm not good at either way i'm better than you we have to we have this need to show that to the society or to our anybody wherever right being in control isn't always about the desire to manipulate situations but often it's about the need to manage perception we want other people to think that we are a composed well maintained well groomed person that's the reason we want to be cool in control but while pretending to be cool right we are missing so much in life we want to control what other people think about us to feel good enough because i want to feel good that when i'm not dancing in front of public there is nothing for them to judge on right i want to feel good enough that at least i'm smart enough not to dance before others right i'm at least i'm smart enough not to sing before others when i'm besura right i am not in i am not a trained singer i cannot sing in the perfect notes so i think as an adult we should constantly work at allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and authentic around some of these issues it is a practice it is a practice where it is very liberating right because the pretense costs a lot it's heavy lifting it drains you if you go to a party and you come back completely drained and tired just see what you are doing in the party are you pretending to be somebody else are you doing small talk by manipulating things or by showing off or by boasting those things will drain you off instead if you are being your true authentic self you actually enjoy going to the parties you actually come back energized you have lot more to talk after you come back you know things like that so see what what is it that you are doing it's very hard but it will pay off it will be very very liberating so will smith the actor hollywood actor said i would rather live my life knowing that i'm not perfect than spend my whole life pretending to be right um punita i will answer all the questions at the end okay uh pretending to be cool we miss a lot as i said 
um, we are silly and goofy around the people we trust. If you actually notice, I have this couple of cousins and couple of friends with whom I talk very differently. I'm so, I make fun of myself. I'm like, I make fun of a situation. I'm so cool about it. Everything, right? But I cannot be the same. I'm very like conserved, reservative, you know, conservative, sorry, conservative, things like that before others. Why? Because I'm not comfortable. I'm not, I'm doing this practice, but I'm not there yet. So, because I don't want people to perceive me as awkward. I am like at work, I have these really, I have been working at the same place for a very long time. So I'm very, very comfortable. I usually make fun of people, right? I tease people, not fun of people and not in a bad way. I tease people a lot, uh, but I don't do that with everybody. It's, I have my safe zone. It's a very, very slow process. Um, it's, it's to learn to be vulnerable is a very slow process, but you will really reap the benefits. It's like weightlifting, right? It's a very slow process to be consistent, train yourself and slowly increase like, you know, um, the weights to become stronger and stronger, but eventually you will see the benefits of it, right? And be mindful of the shame triggers of what people will think. If, like be brave enough to suck at something new. I think... Um, I personally feel that as you grow older, you have, and you have more time, right? Your kids grow up and everything. You will try to fill your time with whatever you are doing with your kids, empty nesters and everything. They will try to fill up. They will try to take up new things. Oh, I always wanted to draw. Let me take a drawing class. I always wanted, I've always wondered what is the big deal in pottery? Let me take a pottery class. One of my uh, colleagues, uh, we were sharing what we were doing and uh, she was like, Oh, I went to a pottery class. It was really nice. And she showed me her coffee mug, which she made. It was very like disfigured <laughs> to be frank, but she was happy and she was proud of it. She drinks coffee from that every day. So it's like, it's really cool. Actually, it's super cool to be that way, to be okay with how you are and what you are and what you do. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> betrayal. Uh, when we value being cool and in control, right? Instead of being passionate, goofy, heartfelt and soul, soulful expressions of who we are, we betray ourselves. We are not being truthful to us and to others. Because what happens if, let's say one, one extreme is I tell people that I can sing a lot. I used to sing like a kid when, when I was a kid and all that. And, but when people ask me to sing, like, now my throat is like not so good today. I'm, I have some cold and sore throat. I dodge the bullet. But later on, I'm betraying them, I'm betraying myself. What if everything is well and good and they ask me to sing before public? What will happen then? The, the shame is even worse, right? It's the awkwardness is even more. Instead, if I accept that I'm a bathroom singer, but I love singing, I love all Kishore Kumar songs, I will sing them, but fair warning, they are not perfect pitched kind of thing, then you will actually enjoy it, right? When we consistently betray ourselves, like when we consistently pretend to be in very cool or in control, right? We can expect to do the same to the people we love as well. So what are we doing at that time? You're not just betraying yourself, you're betraying your loved ones too. When we don't give ourselves permission to be free, we daily tolerate the freedom in others. So I really want you to think when you access control. Let's say you're a control freak with your kids, with your family, with your coworkers. Just look at yourself. Are you giving yourself permission to be free? If you cannot, I think it's very hard to give freedom to others as well, right? So it's, it's a reflection of who you are. <clears throat> and is it always good? Isn't it nice to be free and liberated for once, right? When we don't give freedom to ourselves, we treat our loved ones also the same way. We put them down, make fun of them, ridicule their behaviors, and sometimes shame them. We can do this intentionally or unconsciously. It doesn't matter. That will leave scars on their lives. Why do you want to do that, right? So fixing ourselves actually fixes other uh, the harm that we could potentially do for others as well. So there is this one um, <clears throat> Hopi Indian tribe. They have a saying called, to watch us dance is to hear our hearts speak. That's a very good um, 
saying because it's a lot of courage to let people in to let them know what my heart is speaking right it's very intimate it's um but at the same time true connections are made only when you show your true self to others it's i think people can figure out you know when they say that i have a lot of friends but i have only a couple of meaningful friendships why because either you are not pretending or they are not pretending you have connected them at the soul level that's why you have a meaningful friendship why is it that you have so many friends in facebook in instagram likes by strangers at work but you don't have real true friends where you can talk to them because not because of how they are it's because why how you haven't opened your heart to them yet how you have not been authentic with them yet right that's when so don't try to blame others that oh these people are pretentious it doesn't matter even pretentious people they still have a soft corner they have a heart if you try to connect to that ignoring all the pretense then it's amazing <clears throat> we could be laughing singing and dancing instead of pretending to be super cool and totally in control right that's that's what it is about so that is the end of this chapter and so now we are going to talk about at the end of every chapter she talks about dig deep get deliberate get inspired and get going so how do we get deliberate and how does she get deliberate right if we believe that laughter song and dance are essential to our soul care how do we make sure that we hold space for them in our lives especially in our busy lives oh my god i don't have time to play some music i have to in that time i have to listen to a podcast i have to listen to news i have to listen to this audio book everybody is reading this book i need to read this book <clears throat> so in this busy life in this life where you're comparing constantly to everybody around you and this is what i should be doing i want to listen to music while i'm driving it really calms me but i have to finish listening to 10 pages of this book instead right so how do you get deliberate about introducing laughter song and dance in you Dr Brené Brown she says that we turn on music in the kitchen while we do family clean up after supper we dance and sing which in turn always leads to a good life you can always do that or just it's okay to listen to music and like you know laugh and look at some silly um stand up comedies and have fun in every single minute of your life need not be um towards a goal towards i should do this or i should have because i am already falling behind people of my age are already doing this uh, i have to join a running club because people by the time they hit 50 they are completing a marathon so i should you are always worried because when you compare yourself with lot of people then you are never happy because you are never doing something that you like you are trying to do things that you are supposed to do by this age or your kids even for that matter right so you should always make room a little bit of room for fun get inspired so how does she get inspired she creates themed lists she has different lists like run like you mean it she runs and then god on the ipod for devotional stuff and authentic me what makes her truly happy kind of list um it's basically a theme play i think we all do that we all have theme playlists where we are like you know uh i am feeling certain ways so romantic songs or sad songs or happy songs or the friendship songs or anything like that right so i do this i have a lot of songs um uh, in a in playlist i listen to them um yeah do something like that right i mean i think you basically transform to another world you transform momentarily to a place where it makes you happy which is always good to do you you can you should do it as many times as possible and dare to be goofy i hope you all know this is goofy the name of the character is goofy from disney <clears throat> the mickey mouse cartoon series so i thought it's funny if you actually see goofy right i was remembering when i used to watch with my kids he doesn't care about anybody he is so goofy but he's the most fun character throughout the series you wait for him to come the moment he comes everything becomes super funny so it's that i don't care attitude like i think irrespective of how imperfect you think you are if you are your true, true authentic self people will just love you for that they will just love you irrespective of you could be according to standards you could be dark ugly fat 
um, whatever. You don't know how to wear good clothes. It doesn't matter. The moment you're authentic, if you hear a lot of people, right? She might look like that, but she's very, like, she's very good. Deep down, it doesn't matter. A very successful person can still connect and right away vouch for authentic person. So those people, they are not, they are completely okay to be vulnerable. They don't care. They understand. They're like, I know I'm like this, but I would rather be like this, imperfect, than pretend to be somebody else. There are a lot of people like that. And honestly, we appreciate the authenticity of those people. No matter how you are, how perfect you are, how tenantan you are, still you appreciate authenticity towards pretense. So why not be that way? Be happy, right? Not for others, for your sake. So she says like, how watch the dumb YouTube video that makes you laugh every time and it's okay to watch it. If it's making you happy, it's okay to watch it, right? So this is, that is the end of the guidepost 10. And the final thoughts of her at the end of all this is, <clears throat> Meaningful change in our lives is a process. It doesn't, any process takes time. It's not overnight. It's not instant. Like uh, do this detox diet and you lose five pounds in one week or one day or whatever. It's not like that. It's meaningful change is very uncomfortable and it's often risky. It's same thing, right? If you want to exercise, if you want to inculcate, let's say you are somebody who hasn't um, inculcated exercise in your daily routine. It's very hard to set that time, show up at that time, do the exercise every day. Sometimes it feels like very meaningless. Why the hell am I doing this? Very uncomfortable. You're going out of your comfort zone. I would be rather watching TV during this time. But if you stick with it, the results are always good, right? It's very uncomfortable and risky to embrace our imperfections, to cultivate authenticity, to say, I am enough, no matter what it is. I am enough as of today. Because no matter where you are, there is a position for you. Let's say um, technical, let's say you're a software engineer or something. Technical skills wise, you have certain skills. You are not learning new stuff or anything. That's okay. Based on your skill set, if you're truthful, if you're wholeheartedly work, if you put in your best foot forward, there is a job for you. It's not that every job needs Google kind of things, right? Things like that. So just be your authentic self and first start from the place that I am good enough. I, you have to accept yourself for who you are completely and love yourself because the only things that you're proud of and that you love, you work on them because you want to grow and nurture them. You have a plant, you, you lovingly planted a rose plant or any like, you know, lily or whatever, because you're proud of it, you want to see it bloom and do it well. You'll fertilize it. You'll nurture it. You'll water it every day. The things you are proud of, you will invest in them. So it starts with it's not like I want to invest in myself because I want to be proud of me one day. It doesn't work that way because you are not believing in yourself. You feel that whatever you are is not good enough. It's like, I am good enough today. I am so proud of me that I want to be more proud of myself. So I will do this. Unless you respect and love yourself, you cannot invest in yourself. You have to be that person before you respect or do anything for it. Otherwise, you won't. It's not wholehearted. It's, it feels sluggish. It feels like a chore. It feels like too burdensome to invest anything. If you appreciate authenticity in others, why not inculcate? Why not practice things to make yourself authentic, right? Wholehearted living is about engaging in our lives from a place of worthiness. You have to feel I am worthy enough. Only then you can feel that you are living your life wholeheartedly, right? What is the greater risk? Letting go of what people think or letting go of how I feel, what I believe and who I am. Just think, what is the risk, right? <clears throat> and wholehearted living, right? To wake up in the morning and think no matter what gets done and how much is left undone, I am enough. Don't judge yourself that, oh, I'm not a great mom. The other mom I see, she always, in spite of having a high profile job than me, she comes home, she cooks, she cleans up everything. She reads a bedtime story for her kid. She sleeps at the perfect time. She wakes up, she's doing intermittent fasting. She wakes up at 5.30, she does yoga. She has dogs, she runs the dogs. It's okay. It's okay. Give yourself a break. You are not that person. 
like that that way if i start comparing right in telugu there is a saying that if you um, i don't want to butcher the saying right now but if you think you are good if you think that you have achieved this when you are comparing there is always somebody better than you somebody always better than you you reach this place again somebody better than you you are never happy because you are comparing to people who are better than you right for a change why don't you compare with people who are lower than you and think that i am okay it is okay it is okay if i don't do my dishes what is wrong what if i fall into the category of a messy person it's okay it's okay right so to get to bed so basically you wake up in the morning and think you know what it's okay i'll do whatever i can do and if it is at night think that i am imperfect and vulnerable and sometimes afraid but that doesn't change the truth that i'm also brave and worthy of love and belonging everybody is worth of love and belonging it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter you could be in social standards of failure you don't have a job you are overweight you don't have money enough you don't have education enough doesn't matter still there is a purpose for your life there is something that can be can come to light only if you believe in yourself take what you have and do the best you can with what you have if i give you only 10 dollars elements what is the best you can do in that 10 dollars let's say i gave 1000 dollars budget to somebody else and only 10 dollars to you to host a party to like have few people come in get all the supplies and do it what is the best that you can do within 10 dollars versus the person who has given 1000 dollars are you telling me that you cannot give a good time to people with just 10 dollars think really be resourceful you can right so courage and compassion and connection will be my constant companions that should be your mantra it's like no matter what no matter what how the world is i'll be courageous i'll be compassionate and i will try to connect with people right if you do that that is the summary of whole hearted living that's how you can live whole hearted right the gift of imperfections what are the gifts so we talked about this the entire book is about the gift of imperfections the imperfections are courage compassion and connection they are the gifts why are they imperfect because if you be if you are courageous before others they might say oh my god she's so arrogant they can say all those things they will give the twist of negativity <clears throat> negative connotation to whatever you are doing she's compassionate oh my god if she's so softy if she's so compassionate with everybody how is she going to get anything done she is going to get hurt a lot for everything right every good thing there is a bad angle that you can show connection if i am connecting with people it's like why are you connecting to those people they are no don't do that they they are not at this standard you cannot connect with these people these things they are actually gifts but they make you imperfect they make because in the society of defined things you those will be your imperfections because you will be very vulnerable because you will not fit in with these qualities the opposites of those gifts are fearful if you are not courageous you are fearful would you rather be courageous or fearful if you are not compassionate with other compassionate compassion means being empathetic towards others that means you understand what they are going through if you don't understand what the other person is going through then you are becoming judgmental right it's like yeah she complains she has a headache every morning why can't she do something about it already i'm being judgmental instead like i understand that you are having a headache let's see have you considered uh, taking an uh, like you know some ct scan did you consider maybe this is migraine does it happen only in the mornings then i'm being compassionate with you because i understand what you're going through and i'm trying to give you a solution rather than oh my god can you just stop saying you have a headache every morning just get up be tough enough everybody has some or the other problem just go and work on it that is being judgmental right and if you are not connecting with others then you are alone so would you rather have these gifts of imperfections or would you have the opposites of it pick what you want right if you pick gifts then you have to work towards them right so what if i can't keep all these balls in the air why isn't everyone else working harder and living up to these are the questions which will actually not let you practice whole hearted living why isn't everyone else working harder and living up to my expectations i am working so hard i am trying to be authentic why is that person 
becoming pretentious. That is comparison again. Why do you care? <clears throat> Why do you care? Right? How does it bother you? What will people think if I fail or give up? Let's say I advertised that, hey, I read this book. I want to be more authentic from now on. If I say that and I fall off the track of the wagon, then what will people think? Again, it doesn't matter what people think. It's like baby steps. I'm trying to walk and I will wobble. I will fall. It's okay. Right? And when can I stop proving myself to everyone? You don't have to prove to anybody. You don't have to prove to anybody. That is what the entire thing is. You are who you are and it's okay. So this, she says, it's not like a self-help book, but it's an, it's an invitation for to join a movement. It's for a wholehearted revolution, right? Go to the streets with being messy, being imperfect, being wild. Stretch mark, wonderful, heartbreaking, graceful and joyful, right? Take your life like that to the street, to the place of your work, to the place of your neighborhood, to the place of your family. It's okay. That is the wholehearted revolution because it is infectious. It is contagious. When people see you practicing these things, they are like, oh my God, people are actually liking her. She's really looking like a stupid person right now. But how are people still like joining her? How are How is there a crowd around her? How is, I think it's, let me see. Hey, what did you do? Like, you know, people actually could be contagious. What? what's more than a wonderful world filled with wholehearted people, right? We want that. It's especially when it is filled with so much of pretense and comparison and all these things. Why not? Why not you be the part of the revolution where you are giving that wholeheartedness and authenticity to everybody? It could be a small, quiet grassroots movement. Starts with each of us saying that my story matters because I matter. No matter what you are, your story matters. No matter, no matter what. Choosing authenticity and worthiness is an absolute act of resistance <clears throat> because you're resisting to be cool. You're resisting to be in control. You're resisting to compare to standards. You're resisting all that because you're choosing authenticity. You're saying, I don't care. I'm like this, right? So brave, afraid, and very, very alive. Revolution might sound a little dramatic, but in this world, choosing authenticity and worthiness is an absolute act of resistance. Choosing to live and love with our whole hearts is an act of defense. It, many people around you will not like this change. Even your close family will not like this change. Like, are you sure? Why are you doing this? Don't try to be stupid. I know what you're doing. I understand it, but just don't do it. Your own family will not. Anybody change, it's very difficult to embrace, right? For people around you. It is very, very difficult for people around you to embrace the new you because they got used to a certain you. Whether that person was good or not, they got used to a certain you. Now the new you is like, oh my God, I have to get used to this, right? I have to get used to her stupidity. She's trying something new. <clears throat> You're going to confuse, piss off and terrify lots of people, including yourself. You are going to sit at night and say, what the hell am I doing? Why am I doing this, Right? One minute you'll pray that the transformation stops and the next minute you will pray that it never ends because you're loving it. The more you start being authentic, momentarily it might feel like, oh my God, what did I do? But then you will be proud of yourself. That liberation, that freedom, you want more of it. You want the joy. Whenever you experience joy, you always want more of it. It, it creates a high in you in a good way, you know? You'll also wonder how you can feel so brave and so afraid at the same time. You, It's courageous to be authentic, but it scares the hell out of you as well. It's like, oh, what am I doing? Is this right or not? But if you're brave enough to cross the threshold, then it's wonderful. It's really, really wonderful. So thank you very much. That's the end of this book review, The Gift of Imperfections. It took me 21 sessions and 18 hours of videos. Over a span of seven months, I took a break in between because I was doing the other book as well. And I'm extremely thankful to Dr. Brainy Brown for this book, The Gift of Imperfections. LexisNexis Resolutions, because that's a company I work for. And this book is given by the book club. We have a book club at work and they recommended this book. <clears throat> I'm extremely, because otherwise I never heard of Dr. Brainy Brown. I never heard of her books. 
So the book the originated from there. So I'm extremely grateful. And of course, I'm extremely grateful to Jitin Garu for giving me a platform to share my views on this book. I think this book is like the foundation for any of us to, these are the basic things, right? These are the ABCs. Once we learn how to live wholeheartedly, the rest of the lessons become easy in our spiritual journey. And thanks to each one of you, all of you, for it's exactly one year that I started giving book reviews. I did You Forever before and now this. And for all of